Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I am delighted to welcome you all to tonight's Infrastructure Thought Leader series on engineering large-scale returning walls, the last in this particular series. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and emerging. My name is Amanda Rogers, National Corporate Engagement Manager at Engineers Australia, and I will be your host for this evening. Tonight, we will hear from two civil engineering experts about the causes of retaining wall failures and best practice design. Our speakers will delve into the reasons why and how failures can occur and how to overcome such problems through intelligent design. The two presentations will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. So can I ask you if you could please hold your questions until then. You'll be able to send your questions through via the chat box on the screen during this period. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's seminar is being hosted with our long-standing industry partner, Austral Masonry. Austral is one of our, Australia's largest manufacturers of concrete masonry blocks, retaining walls, pavers and stone products. Austral's innovative solutions can be seen on their high-end architectural projects and landscaping designs. Their commercial solutions include large-scale segmental block retaining wall products and permeable segmental block paving. Austral takes pride in its products, which are of the highest quality and both durable and beautiful. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Chris Haberfield, Principal Geotechnical Engineer with Golder Associates. Chris brings high level engineering skills and technical knowledge and a practical approach, which has been developed through 20 years of research, teaching and consulting. Chris has 17 years experience as a consultant, solving high level technical issues for a wide variety of projects. Some examples include review and value engineering for Melbourne Metro stations, the new Gateway Bridge tender design and North-South Bypass Tunnel in Brisbane. Chris has published over 140 refereed papers, many of them dealing with ground structure, interaction problems, pile performance, retaining walls and analysis of such problems. Chris has been recognised in the industry including awards such as the 2005 Victor Milligan Award, the 2007 E.H. Davis Memorial Lecture and the 2009 Jack Morgan Award. Please join in me in welcoming Dr. Chris Haberfield. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Chris, uh, Chris Haberfield and I'm going to provide a presentation today on why retaining walls fail. This is a very, very broad topic, so I'll be covering mainly at a, at a high level. Uh, and I'll be dealing primarily with large retaining walls, although there's um, lots of aspects of phase of large retaining walls, which also apply to smaller retaining walls. Before I start, I want to I want to have a I want you to have a think about a health and safety moment. Uh, many of the retaining walls we build require temporary works, uh, especially when we dig holes. Uh, we have to provide temporary support to uh, the excavation prior to inserting the permanent retention structure. Um, this, this is an example of an excavation which went very wrong uh, in Melbourne. Uh, it's in weathered siltstone. As you can see, there's been a deep hole up to about 10 metres deep dug immediately adjacent to houses and to, and to roads. The documentation for this retaining wall uh, wasn't particularly good. Uh, but I infer from looking at it that they were going, they intend to use tilt up panels as the permanent retention system, those tilt up panels supported by floors. But in the temporary case, there was no support. Unsupported excavations are dangerous. And tilt up panels often rely on unsupported excavations. So therefore, tilt up panels are a risky option and can be dangerous. So I want to ask you the question, do you make informed decisions regarding temporary works for your retaining walls? 
Do you consider safety in design or do you just consider the cheapest price? The consequences of not thinking about safety in design are this. The engineers involved in the, in the design of this retention system, well, there wasn't one in, in terms of the basement structure anyway, were both found guilty uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So an overview of my talk, I, what we really need to understand is that retaining walls are just a means of permanently steepening bat batters, often from a stable situation to a potentially non-stable one. They basically create a void into which earth and, and water can flow into. And this makes it one of the riskiest things that geotechnical engineers uh, can do. Many designs assume properties, uh, they do not measure them, and they do not give a sufficient attention to safety in design, especially for temporary conditions. They're more worried about the permanent condition. The impacts would occur to the ground and groundwater and requirements for temporary support and long-term performance are often poorly considered in retaining wall design. And often uh, because of cost, um, cost problems or cost, cost considerations, uh, these result in a poor choice of retaining wall with significant oversights with respect to occupational health and safety, how we're going to construct them, what the stability of the wall is, and what the movements around the wall are going to be. So retaining walls are risky business. They are inherently risky. They, as I said before, they create a void for soil and water to move into, potentially causing collapse or partial collapse, displacements around the wall and the surrounds, water inflows, widespread settlement under circumstances. Uh, the forces involved are very large and there are significant consequences if we don't get it right. But unlike tunnels, they're not a self-supporting structure. There's no arching. The ground does not have the opportunity to arch and they're much, much less engineered. So what do I mean by failure? I mean any aspect of unsatisfactory performance of the wall during construction and over its design life, uh, in particular those which result in danger to life and damage to the wall or any land or assets. And these could include collapse or partial collapse. Safety is paramount. The ULS condition must be satisfied. Serviceability uh, usually governs design, however. Excessive deformation, vertical, horizontal rotation are all relatively common. How much movement is too much? This is one of the key decisions the designer needs to make and often get it wrong. Excessive water seepage or loss of waterproofing is another issue. Loss of durability uh, is, or choosing the wrong products and don't have the required design life. So there are numerous reasons why retaining walls fail. Inappropriate type of wall, the wall was just not suitable. Inappropriate design, design of your temporary works, of permanent works, of the durability of the structure. The poor documentation of design and the construction process. During poor construction and or supervision, management and quality control. Occasionally because of unco unco unforeseen ground conditions, in other words, conditions not allowed for in the design and future events not included in the design. And of course, the, the retaining walls are often there for very long periods of time and well beyond the design life. So let's start with the choice of retaining, retaining wall type. The retaining wall must meet the function and the requirements that it is, that it is to, uh, the, for the ground to support. E.g., is it fill or cut? What durability is required? What design life? What's the stiffness of the wall? How much movement do I have to, to have to limit it to? What water tightness do I require? Are there nearby assets? Can it be constructed safely and cost? There are two very different uses for retaining walls. One is to support embankments, the other to support cuts. The engineering of retaining walls for embankments is relatively easy. For excavation, it is often misunderstood and abused. And I'll go into the reasons why. The wall for an embankment is supported, uh, supports the, the soil, generally 
uh, and, the, and the wall is erected before or as the fill height increases. When you go to a cut, the, the, resporting, the supporting structure replaces the existing ground support. So we need to have temporary support while we're going through this process, one replacing the other. The construction of retaining walls for fill are relatively low, low risk, for excavations are relatively high risk. The material supported under embankments are engineered, generally engineered, well known, relatively uniform, and constant properties over time. Whereas in excavations, they're usually natural, unengineered materials, inherently variable, inherent, inherently variable, largely unknown, and the properties may change with time. For fills, groundwater, it's usually above uh, the, the current surface level, so groundwater usually is not an issue. Uh, excavations go beneath the ground, so groundwater is often a major issue. So they're two very different applications. So in order to assess the type of wall you need, you have to think about the height of the retained soil, the ground strength, the ground compressibility or stiffness, the available space you have for construction, uh, and uh, how close you are to other nearby assets such that you don't impact them. Uh, construction impacts, how are we going to construct the wall so it doesn't in impact what temporary works are required, what effect on the groundwater you're going to have, and the design life and durability. Basically, you need to select a retaining structure that is safe and practical to build, suits the application, including design life and water tightness, uh, and the geology and groundwater and protects adjacent assets and life. It's not too bad, but there's a lot there to do. So when you're choosing a retaining wall, I like to ask myself two questions. What, do, what will I do to the ground and how will the ground respond? In excavation, if I excavate into a slope or for a basement, I, it results in unloading of the ground. So you need to think about what unloading of the ground will do. Whereas when I place an embankment or fill and support that by retaining, well, I'm loading of the ground. So you're going to cause settlement and movements because of those issues. So in both cases, you cause movements, stable ground movements, hopefully. Uh, you don't get to the stage where you overload the soil uh, and it fails, but you're on two very different loading paths. The other thing to worry about with excavation, it can result in changes in groundwater. Uh, pressure through drainage. So each of these, you think about how will these impact the sound surrounding ground? How will they impact structures, roads, services and buildings and other assets nearby? And if it impacts it, you need to turn your mind to a different retention system. So what will the ground do in response? The ground will collapse or partially collapse if you don't do it right. The ground will move but you have to make sure that you design everything so you don't get excessive movement. And, the, and you could change the groundwater flow regime. In some cases, you can get piping and liquefaction of the ground. Uh, the, the photograph on the right-hand side shows a, a retention system uh, where the base blew in basically because the water, the, the cutoff for the retention system was not deep enough and the groundwater pressures blew the base of the excavation in. You could have lost the whole excavation in that case. So how do I know what ground movements are too much? Here's some plots you can find in the literature which provide a, uh, the, the types of movements you get or the magnitudes of movements you get for retention systems uh, of different stiffness. So on the vertical axis, you've got horizontal displacement uh, divided by the maximum excavation depth as a percentage and on the right hand um, graph, you've got settlement divided by maximum excavation versus depth. And on the horizontal action, you've got distance from the wall versus maximum excavated depth. So when you have a high stiffness wall, which I call an active system, where you might have post tension bolts and um, nails, uh, anchors and struts, you get much lower, you have much higher stiffness and much lower displacements. Uh, both horizontal and vertical. You can have a passive embedded system 
where, which might be a cantilever retaining wall. So they form into a lower stiffness area here. And then you have passive non-embedded systems where you actually dig a hole uh, or place the fill and let the movements occur. You get your greatest movements over here. So you have to somehow, you've got to decide how much movement your nearby assets uh, can take. And then you must choose a system, at least at this high level, active, passive embedded or passive non-embedded to see that it, it can satisfy those requirements. If it can't, you, if it can't, you need to move up to provide a much stiffer system. So let's move to design considerations. Retaining walls are usually designed for long-term earth pressures and other potential design loads, surcharges, earthquakes, water pressures. So we tend to think about effective stress parameters. Occasionally I see retaining walls design on total stress parameters, uh, undrained shear strength. This is totally inappropriate at except perhaps in very soft clays. Uh, and that's because of a different reason. You should always be using effective stress parameters for retention systems. Under, under temporary conditions, there may be certain uh, times you can use uh, undrained parameters, but you have to think about these with care. For ultimate limit state, you just have to choose appropriate factor of safety. And that's usually uh, guided by the, the codes. You just got to remember that the factor of safety depends entirely on the properties you choose and the method you assume to calculate the factor of safety. So one factor of safety uh, using one method will be different than a factor of safety uh, using a different design method. So you have to make sure that the, the one you're using is appropriate. For serviceability limit state, Displacement occurs due to the release of in situ vertical and horizontal ground stress in cuts. In, in fills, it, it uh, occurs because of the weight of the additional material. How much movement is too much? This is a difficult design decision. There is no right and wrong answer. Some people will uh, think that they can, these structures can tolerate more movement and will allow more movement. Other, others might say zero movement. Zero movement is almost impossible to achieve. So this is a, a very difficult design decision and one that has to be, should be agreed before uh, the retention system is even thought about being designed. And a very important aspect, which is often forgotten, is the safety and design requirements. Can we actually build this retaining wall safely? without impacting uh, people, workers, and without impacting uh, local uh, nearby assets and so on. So how well do you actually know the ground conditions? When we do a retention system, we're often, often uh, provide uh, site investigation within the site. We don't really know what is happening outside the site. So you have to have a fairly good understanding of the geology and what is happening. In this particular situation, this borehole and this, you see two different boreholes, they give two different rock levels, and therefore you might consider that the retaining wall might only need to go down a certain depth. But in actual fact, outside the site, there might be different ground conditions. We don't know those. So you have to keep this in the back of your mind. The main uh, soil properties which drive movements uh, for retention systems is the in situ horizontal stress. Now you've all been through earth pressure theory, so I'll just give a, a, a brief summary of it here right now. When you've got in situ conditions, the horizontal stress we define as a value of K naught or the earth pressure at rest times the, the effective vertical stress and it sits on the axis here, there's no movement. If I excavate and allow the soil to move and, I'm, and I apply resistance to stop that soil from moving or moving much, the horizontal stress moves from the at rest state K0 to the active state, which is along this path shown here by the red arrow. If on the other hand, I try to push that soil and fail back in the other direction, I'm increasing the pressure on the soil 
causing the soil to move up against gravity. And so you move along this red dotted line here towards the passive state. Now we're lucky in soils because the Ka, uh, the, the active state is generally fairly close to the K naught states just because of the depositional processes. But in rocks, as I'll show you later on, you can have very high in situ horizontal stresses, which can cause significant problems. The other thing we have to remember is Ka and Kp are defined by the strength of the material, but they also define the max, the, the limits to which uh, K0 must be between. K0 must be between Ka and Kp. These are Ka and Kp are both failure states. It's this change from K0 to Ka that generally causes displacement and settlement. So let's talk about soil strength, stiffness, and earth pressure. K0 is not a soil property. It depends on stress history and so on. There are certain uh, theoretical um, relationships that you can estimate K0 for certain types of material, but generally it is unknown. Generally for soils, it's closer to Kp, uh, Ka than it is to K0. When we're trying to estimate uh, active and passive earth pressures, we should be using saturated drain strengths, not undrained strengths. And when you're using drain strengths in soil, be very wary of assuming too much cohesion. Uh, cohesion is variable and dominates the strengths for low depth retaining walls. So if you've got 10 kPa cohesion in a clay, you don't need a retaining wall. It will stand vertically for one or two metres. But that's unlikely to happen in reality. Don't be fooled by apparent uh, strength cohesion due to partial saturation. If you're going to rely on suction, you need to think very carefully about it because saturated conditions may not always be uh, present. For instance, if you assume that a, a, a retaining wall uh, in a clay is, is um, the clay is always going to be remain unsaturated. All you need is some leaky surface or something like that to cause that the loss of suction, which can then cause that retaining wall to fail. Be wary of swelling pressures of expansive clays. If you install a retaining wall into a dry clay and it wet, uh, which is highly reactive and it wets up, it's going to push the wall and the, and the pressures on it are going to be much higher than Ka. And the other thing is to be careful of long-term performance of retaining walls and soft clays, generally just because they settle uh, and that causes distortion of the wall and can often lead about, bring about failure of the wall. So here's an example of a gabion wall which was designed where there was an optimistic estimate of soil properties. This wall failed catastrophically. Here is another four level basement where the design uh, was very poorly done. There was insufficient geotechnical investigation. They didn't understand what the soil conditions were. So there was insufficient knowledge of the ground. There was an optimistic parameter, a choice of parameters for the soil, uh, for the anchor, uh, and for the pile verticality, and for the pile vertical resistance. There was insufficient pile overlap for the ground conditions and the diameter of the pile, so it's a second pile wall. The pile embedment was too short because of the uh, over um, the unconservative nature of the assessment of the soil properties. There was insufficient water cutoff because they believed the designer believed the soil was clay, not sand. <coughs> there were, and because of this, there was water inflow through the base. They lost the base of the excavation. Uh, in addition, the anchor capacity was not achieved. There was movement of the walls and there was damage to surrounding assets. And ultimately they lost the fourth basement, which had uh, severe ramifications for this residential building because there were some occupants which didn't have uh, a car parking space. Rock strength, stiffness and earth pressures are an entirely different matter. You cannot apply soil mechanics techniques to designing retaining walls in rock. They are two very different materials. So soil based estimates of Ka and Kp, which I quite often see for retention systems in rock, are not appropriate. As for soil, K0 is not a rock property, 
but in in rock the the horizontal stresses are, can be locked in or due to well tectonic activity can cause very high uh, locked in horizontal stresses and often and can be close to the passive resistance of the of the rock. Uh, we can measure them and in certain uh, situations you should measure the in situ stresses in the rock so you can make a better estimate of what uh, loads or what earth pressures you need to resist. It varies in direction. So in Melbourne, for instance, the horizontal stress in the east-west direction is different than in the north-south direction. If you have situations of K0 being close to KP and you dig a hole, you can actually cause the base of that excavation to fail passively. The, rot, the excavated walls may remain stable, but they are going to move a long way simply because the base of the excavation is failing. And you mightn't even notice this because you're digging the excavation at the base, any failed rock you're just digging, and you just gradually get this movement of the walls coming in. So a big problem. The other thing is that in rock, you've got different, uh, you can have very different stiffness in various horizons within the rock mass. Because these the stresses in the rock have predominantly been caused or, or may be caused by tectonic forces, uh, it will be these higher stiffness layers which carry the load. So when you do a design a retention system in rock, if you assume high normal stress or high in situ horizontal stresses in the weakest layer with the weakest uh, properties, you're going to be overly conservative because in the weakest layers, the, the horizontal stresses will not be anywhere near, near as great as in the stiffer layers. The other th aspect about uh, rocks which make them much more difficult to design retention systems in than in clay is the rock mass strength is dominated by planes of weakness, bedding and joints. These are highly dependent on dip and dip, uh, dip orientation uh, with respect to the alignment of the wall. You can have, for instance, in, in Melbourne, it's quite often to have the, the uh, bedding dipping in uh, towards the west uh, and therefore the east wall becomes problematic, whereas the west wall is not problematic. So you need to understand uh, these type of features <coughs> excuse me, prior to undertaking your design. The other matter is that the planes of weakness, the properties vary significantly. Um, you can have bedding which can vary from the intake strength of the rock down to uh, um, perhaps 10 degrees or lower on slicker sided surfaces. And this may only occur on one plane, but you don't know where that is. So how do you design for that? There's a very big difference in design for uh, a retention system that has to support um, slicker sided bedding planes which are dipping into the excavation than one which has full strength or bedding planes with just strength of the rock. The other aspect is that the rock stiffness is highly increased. So this can often lead to much lower displacements, provided everything is stable uh, and you don't have these wedges, than you would in soil mechanics uh, or in retaining walls supporting soil. It also means that the retention system is nowhere near as stiff uh, is well is of similar stiffness to the rock mass, so it doesn't have as big an impact at uh, reducing displacements as a retention system does in soil. So here's some examples of uh, design of retaining walls which have have gone wrong. This is a piled wall which has actually failed. It's on the edge of a mine, which actually failed because a, a wedge of rock at the toe of the pile um, expressed or failed or moved. Uh, and that caused settlement of the wall, as you can see here. This is a, a large excavation in Melbourne. What you see here is the east wall of the excavation. Uh, you can see a berm which has been installed here, a lot with a, long, a lot of extra anchors, which you can see down the bottom here. That was simply because this hole, this, this wall here along the eastern side, moved along a slick and sided bedding plane, uh, shallow dip but very, very low friction angle. Makes it very hard to design a retention system to uh, resist that type of um, geology. So even something where we thought the rock was quite good, the ground can often offer you some, some surprises.
Water is a big issue. In a lot of cases, no water, no worries. Uh, you know, to suction, well, in, in dry soils, the suction will hold, um, the soil will let, be able to stand without support. So you put water in, it will collapse and so on. So water impacts on everything. The common solution is to provide adequate drainage, um, subsurface and surface, uh, seal permeable backfill to prevent water, prevent surface water ingress. You should never allow surface water to get in behind the retaining wall. Be careful about groundwater in fractured rock because it's just, uh, restricted to the discontinuities, the bedding, open joints and so on. And because of this, they're very small volume, the groundwater can rise very quickly. Uh, and be maintained at very high levels. So sometimes you may need to uh, install sub-horizontal drains during the excavation to uh, keep the groundwater low. You need to think very careful, carefully about depth for satisfactory groundwater cutoff to prevent piping and softening. Uh, and again, how far those groundwater effects are going to be felt outside the site if you're in soft clay. Uh, you can get lowering of the groundwater table and widespread consolidation settlement, which can be a problem. Be very careful what you promise with respect to water tightness. Uh, water will always find a way to get in. A lot, I see a lot of times people talking about active pumping from wells in clay versus uh, pressure relief wells. Active pumping is only... only uh, reasonable, practical, where you've got inflows. If you've got very low inflows, all you need is pressure relief wells uh, where you can use the, the water level in the pressure relief well to set the water level what you're after. And you just use a little pump to, to adjust that. Inflow volumes may not be the only problem. Uh, you can get TDS, uh, total dissolved solids, pollution plumes and all that, which you when you start draining a basement, you can get that material being drawn in. So it's a problem. So here's some groundwater issues. I showed you this one before. This is a well-known one from Dubai. You can look that up on the internet. Just leaking through anchors can be a problem. It, this is a situation where high groundwater table, insufficient uh, barrier to, to water inflow, insufficient penetration, and you'll just get the base blowing in. This is a very simple calculation to make sure that you don't get base blowing. So temporary works are a real problem. For non-embedded walls, uh, such as gravity walls, non-embedded uh, cantilever walls, tilt-up panels, these all require bulk excavation prior to wall construction in an excavated case. Because of that, you're going to get potential significant lateral movements and settlement within the zone of influence the excavation. So you cannot use these walls in close proximity to existing assets. You should not be using them on boundaries if there's any assets nearby uh, because you will get movement. You also need temporary batters. <coughs> and quite often uh, you see a lot of temporary batters which are near vertical. These are the recommendations that I would provide. Uh, the 1V in 1H in rock is not always safe, as I'll show you. You need to be, understand what the, the discontinuities in the rock are doing. But these batter slopes, you will expect some slumping, um, and but generally they will be okay. So here's some situations. This this is uh, back to the one I showed you before. This is a bedding plane which is at about 22 degrees. Uh, if you had a 45 degree batter in that, that would still fail. This is a 45 degree batter uh, in an excavation, and that failed as well it, because of the bedding is shallower and did not have the, the strength to hold the, the, um, the batter at that angle. So you need to think about both of those things. For non-embedded walls, um, the, the other thing we have to worry about is the occupational health and safety. Remember, you, you should not be approaching a batter which is great of near vertical, which is greater than max, greater than 1.5 meters high, and this is often abused. There have been too many deaths associated with uh, batters in soil, near vertical batters in soil, uh, collapsing and killing people. The abuse of these is common. 
It is no good to hope for the best. And I really urge you to ask yourself, are you putting people's lives and assets at risk when you design a retaining wall and when you've got temporary works which are risky? Tilt up panels. Here's an example of a tilt up panel where they provided actually some support, uh, preliminary support, which wasn't sufficient. Uh, they had failure of the tilt up panel, uh, sorry, failure during the temporary works prior to put up the, the tilt up panel, which took out all the services uh, and went back under the road. It was quite difficult to recover from this situation. This was actually caused by a water service. Um, which was um, had was laid in a back uh, gravel backfill trench, which was full of water, and that basically blew uh, the clay off the front of the wall. If we move to embedded walls, um, basically you're talking about contiguous piles, second so piles, soldier pile, diaphragm walls, and sheep pile walls, and you usually use them for deep excavations. There are usually significant potential for large lateral movements and settlement unless you provide uh, appropriate supports and post-tension anchors. You put these anchors and props in rows and excavation always precedes uh, the anchor prop installation. Because of this you get issues due to anchors not being installed correctly which I'll talk about in a minute. The top row of props and anchors too far below the top of the excavation uh, you get over excavation or excavation progressing before anchors prop installation complete. You get water inflows and you've got the problem of near surface adjacent services, which often cause issues with anchor, which uh, cause uh, issues with where you can locate anchors and so on. If you're going to do these type of retention systems, you need to go and read this, this book. It's from Syria, it's, it's excellent. Another reason is a retaining wall failure is because of poor design and construction documentation. The documentation must be sufficiently detailed to ensure that wall is built as designed in every aspect. Don't leave it up to the builder to make decisions regarding how to put something in if it's critical to your design. The specifications must be detailed and targeted. The number of times I've been involved in retaining wall failures where the specification is not at all sufficiently detailed and there are whole areas of which needed to be uh, in the specification which left out. The construction stages must be clearly described and illustrated in the drawings. The key components of the retaining wall must be identified, tested and confirmed. While is usually necessary on embedded systems. They simply provide a redundancy with respect to anchors, props, other support mechanisms, which means that if one of them is not working properly, the whaler will help spread the load. Poor construction, supervision and quality control are another area. We need competent oversight to ensure the plans and specifications are followed. This is rarely done. We need detailed quality control documentation, documentation and checking. When was the last time you looked at the quality control documentation of anchors which were being installed on your site? We need to monitor movement uh, we, and we must be proactive about this. The movements must be provided regularly to the designer, don't leave them in the hands of the builder. The, if you've got a deep retention system, these must be relayed to the designer to make sure that the, as the retention system or the excavation proceeds, that the movements are in line with design. They provide a very uh, early indication if something is going to go wrong. So talking about poor uh, construction, this was a, a soldier pile wall where we've got inclined anchors and we've got a socket here which has to resist those the downward force from those inclined anchors. The piles were so poorly constructed that this allowed the pile to move down under the anchor loads and the wall to move out. So, you know, soldier piles also need to be constructed properly. Anchors are a big problem. They're a major element of support for embedded systems, so they must be right. You must have the grouted length outside the active zone. Now here I refer to the active zone as the zone which is going to fail. It's not like in a soil, 
This is in rock. So here, these are bedding planes. The anchors must go outside the potential block which can fail. In soil, it might be the active zone. In rock, it can be much larger. The fixed zone must be a true fixed zone. It's no use grouting the anchor all the way to the surface because when you test it, you are testing the full grouted length. You are not testing the length beyond uh, the, the active or the zone which is going to move. So you must make sure that the anchors have enough capacity in this area, not over the full length. Be very careful about Q&A with respect to these. I rarely see this done properly. All anchors should be tested to at least their proof load. And to do this, you must have a clear delineation between the, the fixed length and uh, the free length. This is poorly done. This shows, this is an example of, a, of an anchored wall. Uh, there was poor anchor installation in this case for the reasons I've just said. There was over excavation, uh, in other words, excavating uh, additional flitches before putting support in, anchor support in. There was a wall movement of only 20 millimetres in rock, but it caused cracking of the building next door. Uh, the local council came in, gave an emergency order, and they had to put strutting. The movement had already occurred. The strutting was not required, but the emergency works were ordered and had to be done. Unforeseen ground conditions. I want you to ask yourself, what is truly an unforeseen ground condition or what is due to just poor investigation or inadequate investigation? There are very few cases of unforeseen, unforeseen ground conditions that could not have been foreseen if the investigation was to a satisfactory level. I've seen movements uh, due to un, unforeseen ground condition could be, uh, occur because of bedding strength lower than can could be reasonably expected. Um, there was, a, for this particular site I showed you earlier, where there was all those extra anxious put in, there was an extensive investigation. Uh, there was one bedding plane, which was no more than a millimetre thick, which was slick and sided, and it caused a lot of issues. There was also uh, a couple of features outside of the site, which provided release mechanisms uh, which could not also be have been predicted. They're probably uh, true uh, unforeseen conditions. Had another case where there's been high, very high in situ horizontal stresses in rock, uh, very close to KP. Uh, and while that could be tested for, it's not something we tend to test for uh, in retention system design. But I've certainly learned my lesson and in situations where the geology tells me that it could be high in situ stresses, it may be necessary to test for high in, in, in situ stresses. And of course, unknown ground conditions outside of the site because we haven't tested there. The future events not included in design. Well, a major one is a groundwater level rise, e.g. to a water main failure. But I would argue that a water main failure, especially if it's an old water main, is foreseeable and should be designed for at least under ULS. Uh, there's situations where you can have bushfires come through and that can affect the durability uh, of, of retention systems. So that's not something we would not normally design for. Additional surcharge, well, that's really the responsibility of future designers um, or future owners so they don't overload the wall. And excavation below the wall, uh, any excavation you do near to a retaining wall must take account of the location of the, the existing wall. So in summary, retaining walls are a risky business. There are many, many causes of failure and I hope I've given you an overview of the, the major or the most common ones. Collapse is relatively uh, uncommon. Excessive movement is too common. Inappropriate choice of the wall, poor design and construction are, are the most common reasons uh, for why uh, retention systems fail or retaining walls fail. Quality control, quality management needs to be improved over all levels to reduce the number of failures. And unforeseen ground conditions are rare if appropriate ground investigation is undertaken. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Peter Paras, Manager of Engineering Services at Sedgwick. 
Peter is a chartered professional engineer and a fellow of Engineers Australia with over 30 years of structural and civil engineering consulting experience. His experience includes the structural design of residential, commercial and industrial buildings and structures. In recent years, Peter has spe specialised in the investigation and assessment of buildings and structures and expert reporting for building disputes, insurers and property owners. Peter is an accredited mediator and panel conciliator for Domestic Building Dispute Resolution Victoria a member of the Building Appeals Board of Victoria and a committee member of EA Structural College. A committee member of the Building Dispute Practitioner Society as well. Please join me in welcoming Peter. Hello and welcome to Why Retaining Walls Fail. Today we'll be looking at uh, some case studies, lessons and responsibilities. I'm Peter Paris, the manager of engineering services at Sedgwick. So as I said, there'll be some case studies, several examples of failed retaining walls. <clears throat> we'll look at the protection work process, which is a uh, mechanism uh, under the Building Act in Victoria, but the, the principles of that should apply throughout Australia or not just Victoria. We'll look at some factors and causes contributing to failures. There'll be the lessons learned out of those cases. What should have been done better. We'll look at the roles and responsibilities of various parties uh, involved in those cases. Which might include the architect, sometimes referred to or referred to as the designer, similarly the engineer, there's the building surveyor, also known as the certifier and the building inspector, obviously the builder and also the owner. Get into our first case study, it's a small timber sleeper retaining wall, as you can see there, has rotated, displaced, Clearly there, the, uh, there's inadequate design and, and or construction. Uh, the vertical uh, post at the highest end there, you can see is constructed and bending about its weak axis. There's probably something going on with the footing there. Uh, inadequate footing, most likely. You can see that the adjacent masonry retaining wall, probably reinforced, has been performing adequately. Presumably that was designed and constructed uh, appropriately. The lesson here is ensure all retaining walls are included as part of the design documentation. I guess the responsibility may lie with the architect, perhaps the engineer, the building surveyor, perhaps should have picked up that that retaining wall was built, uh, presumably not with uh, design documentation, and of course the builder. We do our second case study here. This is a higher type retaining wall uh, timber log. As you can see there, there's been a failure. Um, the post here has obviously failed displaced, uh, put more load on this last post, rotated this post. That's the base of the failed post, rotted out. There it is there. And some uh, evidence there of some insect termite perhaps uh, attack on that post. So this is a timber log type retaining wall. Now, whilst there was heavy, heavy rainfall precipitated the failure, it was found that it was the long-term rot and probable termite attack 
that was uh, was determined as the proximate cause of the failure. So in this case, the lesson or a lesson is regular inspection and maintenance should have reduced uh, the cost of remediation, would have picked up the rot, the termite attack, the posts could have been replaced before a, uh, resulting in, a, in that failure. Now it's going to be a bigger job to repair. The, the horizontal members have displaced. So um, that's the lesson there. So the responsibility in this case would fall on the owner or the maintenance. But designers probably have a part to play as well, uh, considering the design life and, and the intended purpose of the wall. So was, was timber log the, the right choice, in other words. Look at the next case here is a mass rock type retaining wall. There's been a, a collapse in, in part of it. There's a side view of it. You can see there's a steep embankment here, obviously collecting a lot of water. A catch drain of sorts here. <clears throat> the close up view of the collapse section. No evidence of any uh, drainage behind the wall. So, this, this case of a mass uh, rock retaining wall, again, similar to the last, heavy rainfall precipitated the failure. However, it was determined that lack of adequate drainage behind the wall and insufficient design uh, to be the proximate cause of the failure. The lesson provide surface drainage uh, at the top of the wall, catch drains, make sure they're working, as well as behind the wall. Responsibility here. I guess mainly the designers, perhaps the builder would have had a part in that uh, to, to ensure that drainage was uh, installed. Maybe this wall wasn't uh, designed to begin with, but uh, it's, it looks like an old wall, but still the, the lessons are there. The next wall, sort of similar to the last case study. Uh, this one's a bit more agricultural. Nevertheless, it's still a type of mass rock retaining wall. There's the collapse there. Close up view of the collapsed area. And you can see there signs of vegetation which were growing in and behind the wall, the wall face. Again, a mass rock retaining wall was considered there was insufficient design or and lack of drainage uh, to be contributing factors, but a tree was allowed to grow within the wall at this location. During a storm, the tree was uprooted and displaced part of the retaining wall. So the lesson here is again with maintenance, uh, was thought that with maintenance, not allowing the, the tree to, to grow would have prevented the failure. And that responsibility here is the owner. Now we'll look at protection work. Uh, protection work, what it is, it can be works, measures, procedures, or the like whose purpose is for the protection of the adjoining property from the risk of significant damage from building work. So this is a uh, you know, legislated in Victoria and the VBA, Victorian Building Authority has a, a good practice note, practice note 20, 2018, the last version of it available online. It details all the, um, the mechanics of the uh, protection work process and all, all the required 
So its purpose is to pr protect adjoining property, which may be affected from building work and building work, which may involve things like excavation, footings, or other building work adjacent to the site boundary, or where there is risk of building materials, equipment falling across boundaries during construction activity. So it doesn't need to be right at the boundary, it can be some distance away to still affect the adjoining property. In relation to retaining walls, things to look out for is obviously prevention of undermining, um, ensuring stability is maintained, especially during the temporary state. And noting that adjoining property, even if the, the site is vacant, uh, you still need to protect even the vacant land and prevent, prevent the collapse of soils, for example. As I alluded to, it can be both in the temporary or the permanent post-construction stages. As I said, it's all under the Building Act in Victoria. Uh, again, whilst this is in Victoria, it can apply, the principles apply throughout. And in the Building Act, you'll see a definition of what protection work means. And looking at the, the choice words here, relates very much to retaining walls, talks about lateral support, variation earth pressures, shoring up, stability of adjoining property. So very much applies to retaining walls, especially where they're at the boundary. Further than the Building Act, there's also uh, details of protection work in the building regulations, which you'll see in a moment. The, the five basic steps of the protection work process, all common sense really, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, mechanisms there and a process that allows the adjoining owner to have an import when a uh, building permit application is made, the first step is the building surveyor must determine if protection work is required. There's a form, form six there that uh, provides a notice of, of that decision. If protection work is found to be required by the building surveyor, the subject property owner, in other words, the property where the building work is proposed, that owner must serve a notice to the adjoining property owner, a Form 7, and that notice should also include drawings and other relevant information to demonstrate to the owner, the adjoining owner, adjoining property owner that is, of how their property is going to be protected. The adjoining owner then has 14 days to respond, and that's on a Form 8. And essentially, they'll either agree, disagree, or request more information. And if they haven't responded within 14 days, it's deemed that they agree. However, if there's no agreement, the building surveyor, the RBS, the relevant building surveyor, must make a determination. And that notice of that is with a Form 9. And these determinations by the building surveyor are then subject to appeal by either party to the Building Appeals Board of Victoria. So you can see there's a quite a detailed process that, that is followed. The next case study we have is a reinforced concrete block retaining wall built at a common boundary of two properties. See here, this is the uh, subject property where a new house is constructed on the high side and that's the adjoining property, the ground level there. 
design drawings were issued, which indicated a reinforced block retaining wall at the common boundary. The protection work process was carried out and a building permit was issued. The structural design of the retaining wall indicated a, a height of 1500 millimetres with a 650 by 700 deep concrete footing. Probably looks a bit light on, but nonetheless that what was issued as part of the building permit process, and indeed the protection work process. However, so following construction of the retaining wall, the adjoining property owner raised concerns that the retaining wall was not constructed in accordance with the approved drawings among other things, that it exceeded the design height by 300 millimetres. In fact, the wall was constructed at 1800 millimetres high. So it, that makes a difference, obviously, and uh, hence the concerns of the adjoining property owner. Subsequent checking of the as constructed configuration and dimensions uh, could not justify even, even using refined parameters, refined soil parameters. So that this then became a problem. So the lesson uh, here, as obvious as it sounds, is to ensure that design heights are accurate at the design stage. So in other words, why was it 1500 millimetres when, when an 1800 millimetre high wall was built? And more than that, uh, construction must be in accordance with the drawings. And it's noted that even in this case, the protection work process, uh, which was carried out, doesn't necessarily ensure that um, pro protection of adjoining property will be achieved. So the responsibility here, I guess the architect, the engineer, the building surveyor and the builder all had some part to play in why it ended, why it ended up like this. A bit of the, the planets have aligned and uh, this wall ended up being constructed as such. The next case study, this is a, um, Council Lane, as you can see, there are the back of properties here are very high. A nice crib retaining wall here has been built, and some sort of tiered and other types of retaining wall system happening here to this property. So you can see here in the distance there's something going on. That's probably four to five meters above the level of the lane, so it's quite a high retaining situation here. As we move further down the lane, the only way to describe this is a makeshift makeshift type situation. This is, is a back fence. It isn't the retaining wall as such. The retaining wall is under here. This is the fence. But you can see here, this, this is displaced, so it's not a good situation. The retaining wall there. And we could be kind and call that a retaining wall as well, but you can see the situation here. And the property above is all the way up the top there. So here, you could say there was inadequate design and construction was found to be the cause of the failure. Probably a non-existent design, um, yet a retaining wall of sorts was constructed. The lesson, ensure appropriate approvals and permits, including geotechnical investigation and structural design are all obtained. 
and in this case, clearly the property owner should have uh, gone down that path of engaging a proper design. The next case study, you see here a view down a side boundary of a property. There's a higher side property is the, is the neighbor, a bit of a retaining wall here and a lower one here. That's the level of the adjoining site, ground level. This property over here was recently developed. That was the original ground level approximately, and it was lowered to there. So it, it, it created a need for some retention at, down at this point here. There's a view looking the other way. We can see here, that's about six or 700 mil. And again, six or 700 mil here. That's the original retaining wall and that's the base of the fence there. That's a view on the neighboring side. This paving started to settle and fall towards the fence, which alluded this owner that something was going on. This grass strip didn't help by, there's obviously no continuity. If there is a paving slab underneath those pavers. So as I said, a new house was developed on the low side of the adjoining property. An existing retaining wall has existed at the common boundary. It probably was inadequate in itself, but was functional. The design drawings relating to the new development did, did not include any retention treatment at the common boundary, even though the protection work process was followed. The site cut retention required retention of approximately 600 mil, which resulted in the undermining of the existing retaining wall here. Albeit this is set, set back a little bit, um, there was no design to take into account the, the full retaining system. It resulted in some rotation displacement of the now two-tiered retaining wall system and settlement of the high side paving. The lesson, similar to what we've seen so far, ensure design heights are accurate at the design stage and all necessary retention systems are considered. In this case, again, the architect, the engineer, building surveyor, even the builder, all probably should have had some part in preventing this situation. So again, the planets have aligned there. The last case study I have, there's a rear fence here, newly developed site here, new pool, then it was noticed that this region had started to settle, a bit of a depression falling towards the fence. You can see here the cracking where the pavement here meets the pool structure itself. The close up there, you can see here the gap forming. And that's a close up view there. Displacement there. Some possible, possible because of the rotation, but also a lateral displacement as well. And that's what is behind the fence. That was an already existing retaining wall, um, approximately 1.6 meters high. But when the property adjoining this was developed 
the need to raise that retaining height uh, became apparent. And that was the extension that was put on the, the top of the existing retaining wall. Some embedded posts there. It's the timber post, which is the structural post. The steel there adjust brackets for the horizontal sleepers. That's presumed they're just timber posts embedded in behind the existing wall. <clears throat> so sort of the opposite to the previous case, this is a new house developed on the high side of an adjoining property site. The existing retaining wall, 1.6 metres, which had existed. Design drawings didn't include any retention treatment at the common boundary. Again, the protection work process was followed. The new swimming pool was located and founded such that it did not impose lateral load. So this pool here, its depth was deep enough to not in, uh, affect the retaining wall. An engineer involved in that clearly catered for that. But what happened over here was, was clearly missed. <clears throat> the new retain, retaining wall was constructed, effectively adding 0.8 meters to the, to the retaining height resulting in a total retained height now of 2.4, which as we know is quite substantial or a substantial increase. And it resulted in some rotation displacement of the retaining wall system and settlement of the ground paving. Possibly some of the depression is due to consolidation, but nonetheless, the retaining wall system was uh, thought to be inadequate. The lesson, similar to previous, ensure design heights are accurate at the design stage and that appropriate retention systems are considered. Again, architect, engineer, building surveyor and builder. So in summary, what we've seen today Causes of failures and responsibilities are often a deficiency in one or more of the following. And we can see as we go through the design, construction and the in-service stage. Architectural, making sure the geometry is right, the survey, etc. I've written there, in my experience, that seems to be a high incidence of occurrence as, as a cause. Structural design, I guess uh, as an engineer, uh, luckily it seems to be a low incidence relative to the others. Civil drainage or the lack of is the high incidence. Geotechnical, the investigation, getting the, the soil parameters correct. Um, that's a low incidence. The whole approvals and building permit building inspection stage is a high incidence. Construction, high incidence. Things are built not in accordance with the drawings, for example. As I mentioned, the inspection stage as well. Uh, things are inspected, but uh, any anomalies are not necessarily picked up as much as they should be. And when we get to maintenance, obviously things need to be checked, maintained, inspected, even after the construction stage. Lessons. Design documentation to include all retaining walls and retention systems, particularly at site boundaries. These are often missed. They're often thought, well, they're not part of the main building, or we'll deal with them later whatever, but uh, it's important that the entire perimeter of a site is looked at, especially 
where you're not in flat areas and you're going to have retention retaining wall systems. And of course, the design needs to be in accordance with accurate geometry levels. And needs to be in accordance with the geotechnical investigation. Construction needs to be in accordance with the design documents. And then the approval permit and inspection process should act as a gatekeeper of the above. Often things uh, don't get caught in this process, but I say they should be, but as is reasonably expected uh, because there's not necessarily the expertise of a building surveyor to ensure certain things of, a, of an architect and, and an engineer. And then finally, appropriate and regular maintenance of retaining walls throughout their design life. <clears throat> so just a final thought on why do retaining walls fail? A quote there from National Academies of Sciences, Engineering Medicines from the USA, incidents and accidents almost always result from a series of events, each of which, which is associated with one or more cause factors. As I was saying, it's because the planets have aligned. So you saw in those case studies, there were several steps that could have uh, prevented the failure, but because the planets have aligned, we ended up with a failure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the planets have aligned. Um, our speakers will now come together to take questions from our audience. If you could please send your questions in for the panel via the chat box on the screen, uh, ensuring you provide your name and who the question uh, is for. Uh, we also asked for some question on registration. So um, my first question has come in from Richard in New South Wales and it's been directed to, to Chris. Um, Chris, do private certifiers have obligations to prove they witnessed actual construction of structural elements on subdivision sites? Um, Chris. Uh, it's probably not a good question for me. <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, more a question for the other speaker. Perhaps you can aim it there. Peter, would you like to comment? Oh, well, there's certainly... Um certain uh, regulatory requirements depending on the state. Uh, in Victoria, there's mandatory inspections and there probably isn't mandatory inspections unless there's a concrete pour. So um, I, I think I uh, heard the question right. It was about uh, what should be inspected. Thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Milan in, in here in Victoria. Um, should design uh, life criteria of greater than 100 years be applied to any retaining walls, especially where significantly important structures are being supported? Examples given are freeway, hospital building, essential services where future replacement will be impractical. And Milan has directed this question to Chris. Yeah, well... <coughs> It's going to be very difficult for any engineer to certify 100 years. Um, who knows what's going to happen in 100 years? So while it would be uh, preferred that we, uh, for certain uh, structures and so on, that retaining walls should be certified for in excess of 100 years, I'm not sure it can practically be achieved. Who's going to sign off on any component? Um, I just can't see it happening. Thanks, Chris. And just while, you, while you're there, Kyle um, has sent through a question for you um, live saying, as mentioned, there are still several cases of basement excavations failing within Australia. What do you think needs to change to improve the design and construction of basements in the future? Uh, there's a lot that needs to be changed. Um, I think the building regulations need to be changed such that there is an engineer of record uh, to oversee any deep basement type excavations. And I, when I say deep, it, deep is relative. If you're 
doing a basement excavation of two and a half metres deep for a, a house next to another house, that is deep. And, and, and there should be engineering certification on the retention system and so on. Uh, we need to get much better at uh, the protection notices. Um, there are cases where there's deep excavation and the building surveyor decides there's no protection notice required. I have seen buildings uh, suffer significant damage because simply because of a, an electrical service trench dug next to a footing. And that's caused significant problems to the building, which only uh, became apparent a few years later. Um, so our protection notices system needs to become a lot better. Whether that's a problem for building, uh, whether building surveyors have become better educated or whether they need to actually employ uh, the appropriate engineers to, to um, provide them with recommendations and so on. Uh, with very deep basement excavations, we need to get much better at our retention systems. Uh, sorry, much better with our monitoring. We need to insist on monitoring and that monitoring is done throughout the process. Uh, we should also have clear guidelines on what movements are allowable. At the moment, uh, the uh, amount of allowable movement is, is a decision made by um, whoever. Uh, quite often the structural engineers say to the geotech engineer, how much movement do you allow? And this geotech engineer will say, well, that's your problem. It's your structure next to it. How much movement can it tolerate? And in the end, you know, there, there's obviously a specification which is either too much or too little. And then you come back to the design and inappropriate design is done to satisfy those movements because too few people make assessment of movements next to retaining walls. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Peter, do you want to add to that at all? Um, yeah, well, tie the sort of regulation, guidelines, standards uh, in all that Chris mentioned. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, I mean, traditionally, standards have developed over practices. So as, as we want better outcomes, uh, I'm all for you know, creating standards and uh, regulations for it. Definitely. Thank you. I, sort of following on from that in a topic, this is about insurance and it's come in from Peter, who's asked whoever wants to respond, is it feasible to be a structural designer of residential cantilever retaining walls and still have PI insurance? Uh, I might answer. Thank in you. That, yeah, in res well, it depends on the state you operate in. Uh, certainly in Victoria, you need to have PI insurance to be a building practitioner uh, and to um, uh, work as, a, as an engineer and uh, you know, certified design retaining walls. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a question from Adrian, who's uh, watching from Malaysia, and Adrian is asking, how prevalent is poor or no maintenance of retaining structures a cause of failure? Chris? Oh, okay. I thought Peter would do that, be seeing his uh, Yeah, no, look. I can if you like. Um, yeah, I go for it. Uh, well, you would have seen some of the examples. Uh, maintenance was, uh, you know, they're only relatively minor retaining walls, but still, uh, you know, uh, lack of maintenance uh, was certainly shown to be the, the factors there. So uh, it is prevalent. I guess it's more, more so, you know, with, with timber. Uh, structures uh, or timber timber retaining walls uh, in relation to their durability. I guess there's also maintenance of uh, drainage, drainage systems behind the wall, uh, catch drains above the wall. There was an example there. Chris, if you have anything to add or? Um, drainage behind the wall can be a, a real issue if you've got large inflows. So if you've got continual inflows, you need to have some type of system in place which can clean out the drainage. Otherwise, it will clog up very quickly. Um, most retaining walls, however, have low amounts of seepage and the drainage is usually quite adequate. Uh, one of the issues is that, uh, is that some retaining walls are built with permeable backfill, 
but they're not sealed at the surface. So they allow surface water to get in behind the retaining wall and that causes an issue. It, it, I suppose it really comes down to the choice of retaining wall. You know, is it appropriate? Have you used the right building materials and so on? If you're building a retaining wall somewhere you can't get access in the future, it needs to be of very durable materials and timber is not appropriate. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, we've had a question that, from Mario that's coming from South Africa uh, for Chris, asking uh, what is the maximum lateral movement allowed in urban areas? The South African Code allows for 35 millimetres in urban areas, and I'm wondering how it compares to Australia. Um, re, any way to provide vertical drainage in raft to deliver water rise pressure and to provide proper drainage in basement in the basement to collect water in bore wells. I'm hoping. I, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about the second part. Mm. Um, the I don't think there is any specification in Australia with respect to maximum movement, and I think that's one of the issues. Um, the quite often the, a structural engineer, or in my experience, quite often the structural engineer will specify. Uh, sometimes they specify unrealistic amounts, like two, three millimetres for a 10 metre deep retention system, which is just almost impossible to achieve. Um, and in other cases, they know not specify anything. Uh, so it, I don't think I can help you there, but it's it's something which we need I, I would like to see in legislation, so it takes the emphasis off the engineers deciding how much movement is too much movement. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, we have a, a question from Haney, um, who's asking, um, why do builders mix between retaining systems like shoring and diaphragm walls? Yeah, well, I guess it depends on the particular circumstances, the architectural requirements, uh, basically the thickness of the retention system uh, dictates uh, what system uh, is adopted. Uh, obviously there's pressures for maximizing your basement size, car parking, etc. So that's in short why they differ. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for all these questions, by the way. Uh, Sagar is asking a question for, and he's asking for a four metre high retaining wall in rock. What type of temporary works can be considered? If somebody would like to pick that one up. So uh, that is a very open question. So what type of rock? What are the, the fractures, discontinuities in the rock? What's the strength of the rock? What's next to it? Um, you know, is there any um, assets next to it? Uh, is there potential for rock wedges to fall out and impact on workers? You know, all those types of things need to be considered. It's not a question without more detail. It's just not something I can answer. But certainly at four metres high, uh, you, would, you would want to have very good rock conditions with very few fractures. Uh, uh, to stand it vertically without any uh, temporary um, support. Uh, this, this situation quite often happens in lift overrun pits at the bottom of basements for uh, tower structures and so on. In those cases, you, you will dig them vertically, but you put in soil nile and shotcrete and mesh support. Um, so like I said, it's, it, it's, it's a very open question. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you. You did a good job answering that one. Um, we have uh, run out of time uh, this evening, um, and I'd, I'd like everyone virtually to join me in thanking Dr. Chris Haverfield and Peter Paris for their time and insights shared tonight. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our industry partner, Austral Masonry, for making to tonight's webinar possible, uh, which is the fourth and final in this series. Um, and I'd just like to draw your attention to the Engineer of the Year Award uh, nominations. Uh, um, nominations are currently open and we're looking to recognise outstanding engineers who show innovation and resourcefulness in their work, which I'm sure you all do. Uh, for further information, please visit the link on screen.
Obviously, we're in difficult times with COVID and we really are looking to appreciate your, your feedback as to these webinars, uh, what, what the experience has been and how we can improve uh, going forward. There will be a link in the description box below um, and I really encourage you to fill it in. So once again, on behalf of Engineers Australia, thank you so much for joining us tonight and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you.